What's going on everyone, this is Hoagie Hacks, and today we're diving into removing signatures from malware. Let's get into it. Before we get into the video, my name's Logan. I'm a security researcher. I'm also OSCP certified. This channel talks about offensive security, coding, security news, and entrepreneur stuff. If that's something you're interested in, subscribe, hit the like button, and let's get back into the video. First, we have to understand what signatures are if we're going to try to break them. So I actually have an article here that I found from Sentinel One, which Sentinel One is a company that does antivirus and endpoint detection and response software. And the way that they define malware signatures is a technique that involves reading or scanning a file and testing to see if the file matches a set of predetermined attributes. These attributes are known as the malware's signature. So what does Sentinel One mean by these attributes? Well, if we think of it as what is in a portable executable file, for example, you have your code, which in your code you have strings, you have the functions that you're calling, so imported functions, and you also have the order that you call these functions. These are all different types of attributes, even down to even like the file size or the date, stuff like that. These, any way that it can be a consistent signature for threat intelligence analysts to write rules for that can say, hey, this is a malicious executable and we can for sure know this at a very high probable rate. These detection engineers can take advantage of these attributes within portable executable files to create these rule sets. And a common way of doing this is using something called YAR rules, which YAR rules basically allows a malware researcher or detection engineer to set attributes about a executable, like strings, for example. Like in this uh, GitHub page here, I actually have a YAR rule for uh, like Metasploit Meterpreter shell. And so we can see here that one of the strings it ch checks for is this prologue that's in Metasploit apparently. There's also WSA startup, um, WSA socket. And this says like if this executable has all of these signatures and the file size is less than five kilobytes, then you're gonna get an alert. And it's gonna be saying this is a interpreter shell and you're gonna get flagged. And so it's in uh, shell code, which this is basically, um, like think of it as like if you had someone that said hello world, then it would be what it is, what hello world is in ASCI instead of uh, just plain text hello world. And so you can see there's more and more rules like L host L port. Um, this is very interesting. This is like very common when it comes to C2s in general is the loading of libraries and then opening an internet connection and then making that request and sending it back and it has all of these to see if these functions are being used, what order they're being used, and it has all of them and the file size is less than five kilobytes, then it's gonna alert as this is probably a Metasploit script. So how do we get around all of this and go undetected by these pesky detection engineers. When it comes to getting rid of signatures in malware, it really comes down to three main things, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do, but I'm only gonna talk about what you see most people doing. And one of those things is, first of all, just payload encryption. This is assuming that you're loading your malware somehow, usually with shellcode, it's usually an implant, and you're injecting your code somewhere, and your shell code itself should 100% be encrypted because you're gonna avoid basically all signatures when it comes to possible malicious signatures that are within that malware code you have for that implant. And I still have to handle the rest of your code, which is like doing the injection process, for example, which for that, a lot of people, one, uh, do string and API hashing. So they're not actually using the function names as strings, they're hashing them. And you can also just 
change the order of how things are working and kind of change the behavior, even though it's a static based detection and it's relying on signatures, a lot of times detection engineers are using how things are ordered, the amount of a certain function, so like how many times you use it. It's stuff like this where you have to think like, well, what am I doing and how can I completely change the behavior of my program? And then you could also just add random stuff, like literally add a calculator into your program, for example, and you'll be surprised that this actually is going to help you out a good amount when it comes to just behavioral analysis. So let's get into doing this payload encryption first and I'll go through the code and give you an example of, of how making these small changes can actually really change the detectability of your code and we'll look at that in virus total. So let's get into it. So what I've got here is just a very, very, very simple, like this is the most basic shell code injection you can do. It's literally taking shell code, which this is Metasploit uh, reverse shell code, which I generated using this command here, which is going to give you a reverse shell in C. You can literally just copy and paste this. Um, tons of signatures in it. And as we saw in the YAR rules, I mean, some of them, I, know, I don't know if you can uh, go back in the video, but you'll actually notice that like the Metasploit Prolog, for example, and stuff like that, you can notice signatures in here just by looking at the shell code. Now, what we're doing in this shell code injection is straight up, we're starting a process of notepad.exe right here using create process, no fancy native uh, API functions, just straight up create process w allocating memory within the process and then writing to that process with our shell code. And then we're spawning a remote thread on starting at the start of our remote buffer, buffer and then properly closing the handle, which should execute our shell code. So I'll put this here just to show it works. Um, currently, Defender is not on because if we left this on, then it would get caught immediately. Um, so I'm going to set a listener on my host machine, on my uh, uh, Kali attack machine here. This is an Ubuntu machine, actually. I don't know why I said Kali. Um, we're going to build this project. I'm just calling it basic inject. Okay. And then I'm going to open up the um, our exploit here. So here we go, going into x64, release. Here's our basic inject. I'm just gonna open up a terminal so you can see this better. And then I'm just gonna run it. Which it opened up over here on my other monitor. Here's the notepad. And we see here that I have a shell. No, no surprise. Um, but what does this look like when it comes to actually uh, detecting it? And like what do the detections look like on virus total? So I'm going to open up Chrome real quick, open up virus total. We're going to drop this puppy in here. Okay. I'm going to uh, add our release file, which should be this. Open it and let's check this out. Not a robot. Oh my gosh. No way does it think I'm a robot. Alright. Okay. Let's 
Try again. All right, there we go. As you can see, it's already not doing great. Two for two. 12 out of 22. Let's see how many we get. Should be a decent amount. All right, so 39 out of 72. Honestly, I feel like it should be way more. <laughs> but uh, this is not great, and you wouldn't want this uh, in like a red team engagement, for example. So let's now add these uh, bypasses that we were talking about, or not really bypasses, but try to get rid of these signatures that are getting picked up by these AV engines. Okay, so like I said earlier in the video, the first thing that I always try to do is just encrypt the payload. You're gonna take out a lot of AV engines that are picking up on your signatures just from encrypting the payload. Now, I, you can do this, you can use AES uh, RC4, um, but for just the purpose of this video, I'm just gonna make it very, very simple. And we're gonna do a Zor encryption. I'm gonna comment the rest of this out. Um, kind of show you how this is working out. Okay, so basically what I did here is we're doing Zor encryption, which if you don't know what Zor encryption, basically what happens is you're doing a uh, an or Zor action where you take the key and the byte and you put them against each other. And basically what happens is that you're outputting a new value. And basically it's not a oh, you need an encryption function and a decryption function. It just works both ways. So all you need is the key. So what I did here was I made this function where I printed our shell code in a nice form in an encrypted format. So right here is actually the shell code from earlier that's from up here in a Zor encrypted format. So what I'll actually do now is I'll try to show you the result of doing this Zor crypt function. So I'm just going to comment out the rest of this just, just for a little bit. And I'm going to have this run, but I'm going to use this old shell code that was, this is the non encrypted shell code. Going to replace this. Which this is currently the encrypted one, but we'll get our new encrypted one in a sec here. I'll save that. And uh, currently the key is you will fall. <laughs> um, but you can, there's better ways to store this key, uh, like compile time uh, generation of the key, for example. Uh, I wouldn't suggest just putting it in clear text like this because uh, a malware forensic person can just, you know, run strings on this and easily find the, create the key and decrypt your, your payload here. Sometimes even AV engines can do that too, so I would watch out for that. But let's run this. And I forgot to print it. That's great. Let me print this real quick. Okay, now we should get it. There we go, beautiful. All right, so this is our encrypted shell code right here from the output over our Zor function. So I'm gonna copy that, close this out, and remove this now, um, and paste in our encrypted shell code here. Bang, bang, all right. We're going to uncomment this, and I have not changed anything from this. The only thing that's different is that currently the shell code is encrypted, uh, and I'm running the Zor crypt function so that it becomes unencrypted or decrypted when on the time it's executed in the create remote thread. 
So I'm just going to comment this function out just because we're not using it anymore. And now I'm going to give this give this a little build. Now that that's built, I'm gonna open up terminal real quick. We'll go back to our release. And just to show that it's properly working right now, this still is not going to um, get past Defender, but you'll we'll see that it actually did uh, get rid of a lot of detections. So I'm going to go back to Terminal and run this. Boom! No pad launched up. And we should have a show. Look at that. And we're my user. Great. Okay, so let's see how these detections look in Virus Total. So let's open up Virus Total again. Remember, so before, 39 caught it on the one without any encryption. Let's see what it looks like with one that does have encryption. This is. The newest one in the release. I'm just gonna open this and let's check it out. So I mean, already it's doing much better than this other one that had 39 detections. Let's see how much this one has though. So this one had 28, 11 less. And that was just encryption, which can easily be done. And honestly, I think it was like 24 beforehand. And uh, when I first was preparing for this video and just making it work. So um, definitely surprising that even all of these did not catch like Sophos, really. It's, I don't know. It's, it's honestly crazy. But there is so much more we can do. Um, and the timing of this video is uh, becoming very long. I've got some string API hashing coming up. Uh, and I want to go into some more advanced stuff like metamorphic and polymorphic code. Because um, right now this is just very surface level stuff. But stay tuned for part two of this video series where I'm going into removing signatures from malware. The next video is going to be a bit more advanced and we're going to focus on a little bit more complex tasks that hopefully we'll be able to see we can get our very, very basic injection with Metasploit uh, down to at least single digits on virus total. With that, subscribe, like the video, and thanks guys. Peace.